So this is uh, Grace in the Book of Romans. Uh, this is uh, lesson number 12, forgot to mention that. Lesson number 12 in the series. The title of the lesson, The Refusal of Grace. We're going to be covering uh, Romans chapter 9, 1, all the way to chapter 11, 36. So uh, let's take a little bit of a review here. Uh, in chapter seven and eight that we covered uh, before, Paul answers the question on how God provides for saved people even though they are sinners. Remember the question was, if I'm a saved person, if, got the, if I have the spirit within me, why is it that I struggle with sin all the time and how do I deal with that? And Paul uh, answers uh, that question by saying, well, God helps you to deal with the problem of being a regenerated you know, spirit inside of a fleshly sinful uh, body in two ways. One, he justifies you, he guarantees that your sins are forgiven, that's justification, and he provides you with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, and that Holy Spirit helps in the process of sanctification or spiritual maturation. So that's what we talked about last time. Now in chapters nine, 10, and 11, Paul is going to answer yet another question but this one dealing less with the gospel itself and more with the Jewish nation. Now two key doctrines among evangelicals come from this passage and so we're going to discuss this passage in light of these, uh, you know, these particular teachings among Baptists and other you know, religious groups uh, in a moment. Uh, we're going to do an overview of the three chapters and then read key verses. We don't have time to read everything. All right? So the key question I'm talking about is why were the Jews not saved? He's talked about how you're going to be saved and what Jesus did and he died on the cross and you get the Holy Spirit and you have all of this how wonderful you know, God's mercy towards you. So the question is, well, you know, the Jews, they had all that access to all of this. Why weren't they saved? What, what did they do wrong? So the key question discussed, why weren't the Jews saved? This question would be coming not from Jews, they would be coming from Gentiles. Because Christianity was a religion you know, steeped in Judaism. So the Gentiles are saying, wait a minute, you know, how, how come the Jews didn't, <laughs> you know, how come they didn't get it? What's the problem? So we begin in chapter, uh, chapter nine. In chapter nine, Paul explains, uh, if the Jews had all the advantages, why did they fail to obtain salvation? And the first question in that larger question would be, did the law fail them? They had the law, was the law no good? Did the law not you know, do its job? And Paul will answer the law or the word of God. It didn't fail. It brings salvation to whom salvation has been promised. The promise, however, is not based on culture or heredity, but it is based on God's word. So let's you know, skip down to chapter nine, beginning in verse six. He says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. So there's an, an answer to that hypothetical question. You know, has the law failed? So he says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So he's saying the promise of salvation made to the Jews is not based on culture. It's not based on the fact that you're related to Abraham in some way. The promise is based on God's word and he doesn't say it here, but how you respond to God's word. And so he, he's establishing the basic premise for the entire argument that he's going to make in chapters 9, 10 and 11. So in the following verses, verses nine all the way down to 29, Paul gives several examples where he shows that God's word is the basis for determining what happens. Not man's will, not man's work, and not his culture. Remember, the Gentiles are saying, well, they're Jews, they're related to Abraham, they got all the advantages, how come they didn't make it? 
And Paul's answer is, well, they didn't make it because they didn't respond to God's word. Not because they, there was something wrong with their genealogy, not because they were you know, culturally, you know, they, they were owed this simply because they, they were part of the uh, Jewish culture. And he, he'll name four different examples where this is so. And this is what we're going to look at here. He begins by mentioning Rebecca. Again, I don't have time to read everything. Uh, I'll simply paraphrase here. So he begins with the example of Rebecca. She was told by God's word that the older of her children would serve the younger of her children. And despite every human effort to change this, Jacob, the younger, eventually was served by Esau, the older. Because in the culture, it was the older child that received the promise, that received the, the double inheritance. You know, it was the older child that received the promise. But God's word said to Rebekah, in your case, that's not what's going to happen. In your case, the younger is the one that's going to receive the promise. And we know the story, how they tried to get Esau to get everything. You know, Jacob, uh, um, Isaac was trying to, uh, to, to, to give the promise to Esau. You know, he did everything in his power to give the promise to Esau. And what happened in the end? Jacob, got the, Jacob, received, the, Jacob received the promise. So it's not culture or birth order that determines what happens, but God's word and God's promise. That's what determines what happens. He gives another example of Moses in verses 14 and 15. God told Moses that the fact that he was, uh, the fact that he saw God was because God decided to do it. Not because Moses asked. Moses asked God, can I see your face? And God said, well, I'll let you see you know, me passing by. Moses didn't get to see God because of you know, the fact that he was a leader of the Jewish people, because of the fact that he did, you know, he did many great things through the power of God. That's not the reason why he got to see God. He got to see God because God permitted it. Another example, the Pharaoh, kind of a negative example here in verses 16 and 17. God clarified by his word why this particular king had ascended to such power. Why did Pharaoh become such a great king? How is it that this particular man become so powerful in his era? Was it because of his intelligence? Was it because of his military prowess? Well, what's the reason? Well, God gives the answer, or Paul gives the answer. And the answer is, so that by his defeat, the greatness of God could be revealed to all the world throughout history. If the Pharaoh was some kind of puny, you know what I'm saying, just a lackey, weak-willed you know, king of some third-rate nation, the fact that the Israelites were released you know, would not have been a great witness for God. But Paul says, God permitted, God allowed this particular king to rise to, to world dominance for a reason. And that reason was when the time came to release the children of Israel and it became a test of wills between this king and God, God demonstrated how powerful he was in sending the plagues and then destroying the army and so on and so forth. And then another example, he talks about the saved, the people who are you know, saved by Christ. By the word of God, through the prophets, they were told that they would be called to receive God's promise. This example of how God's word is sure and never fails, its intended purpose acts as a bridge towards the final verses in which he makes his point about the Jews and why they failed to receive the promise. So in chapter nine, verses 30 to 33, Paul will say, God's word, the law, did not fail the Jews concerning salvation. He's just shown that the word never fails anyone concerning anything. When God says this is going to happen, it happens. And he's given examples, right? When he said to Rebekah, the younger will serve the older, it happened. When he said, this Pharaoh you know, is going to fall, it happened. So he says, God's word always succeeds. So it's not, the problem was not with God's word, not with the law, okay? He said, 
It was the Jews themselves who failed the word and by doing so they missed the promise. So remember the question, why did the Jews fail? Was there something wrong with the word of God? Paul says, no, nothing wrong with the word of God. The problem was not the word of God, the problem was how the Jews responded to the word of God. Well then, why did this happen? So let's read the passage where he answers this question specifically. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, pursuing law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So why did this happen? First of all, Paul says, the Jews tried to obtain righteousness, right? Meaning acceptability before God. They tried to obtain righteousness through a system of adherence to a rule of law, rather than by the, what the word of God said. The word of God has always said that man attains righteousness through a system of faith. And all the Old Testament heroes demonstrate that. You know, Noah was not saved because he was, you know, the best and most pure person. He was saved because when God told him do this and do that, by faith he did it. He responded to God by faith. And God's word never fails. If he says that we're saved by a system of faith, then that's the way we're going to be saved. Secondly, they rejected Jesus, the Savior. And in doing so, they lost the promise that he brought. And what was the promise that he brought? Well, the fulfillment of God's promises from old, forgiveness of sin, eternal life. He brought those promises to the people and they, in rejecting Him, well, they also rejected those, those uh, blessings for themselves. So the Word was able to deliver on its promises, but it, but it delivers on its promises based on its conditions, not your conditions, all right? And the Jews, Paul says, failed because they did not accept the word and they did not accept the conditions of the word. Well, what were the conditions of the word of God? Well, they had to believe in Jesus. That was the condition. You know, they said, well, we want to be saved, but we don't want this Jesus guy. Well, no, <laughs> no, you're not going to be saved your way. All right, so that's chapter nine as, as, you know, as compressed as I can make it in the time that we have. In chapter 10, in chapter 10, in, this, in the first section, chapter 10, verses 1 to 15, Paul argues that God has always based the reception of His promises on faith. Now some argue that in the Old Testament, God worked with man based on a system of law. And then in the New Testament, he works with man based on a system of faith and grace. I've actually heard people teach this in a Bible class, and that's, that's false, that's, that's incorrect. God has always worked with man based on a system of faith, always, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Okay? So in this section, Paul responds to this issue by quoting Isaiah and, and other Old Testament prophets who taught that God's blessings and salvation have always been based on faith and never on adherence to a system of law. So let's read a little section here. In chapter 10, verses eight to 11, he says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Does that passage of scripture sound familiar to you? Isn't this the passage of scripture that you most often hear quoted 
by our evangelical friends when they're having a meeting or on TV or something like that. When it comes to the moment of calling people to respond to the preaching. And that's because many evangelicals see these verses as the expression of faith that one must make in order to be saved. In other words, the you, know, you have faith. Faith is believing as true what God has said. That's faith. The expression of faith, however, changes from time to time. For example, Noah's expression of faith was what? Well, he built the ark, right? Moses, his expression of faith was what? Well, he went back to Egypt and he faced the Pharaoh. All throughout, all throughout the Old Testament, there's always been a, an expression of faith that God required of individuals. So, our evangelical friends believe that this passage here contains the expression of faith that individuals must make or have to do in order to be saved. And that is that they believe in their hearts and they confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. So that's, that's their expression of faith, a mental assent and a, an open acknowledgement. But the correct expression of our faith in response to the gospel is not described here in chapter 10. It's described back in Romans chapter six. This is where Paul is talking about how we respond to the gospel. How? All those who have been baptized you know, into Christ have died with Christ, right? And they raise up with Christ to the newness of life. Okay. In chapter 10, he's talking about law and faith. So again, for it, most evangelicals, Protestants, the answer to the question, how shall I respond to the gospel? The answer they find is here in chapter 10. Well, I just say, I believe. And uh, you know, acknowledge that Jesus is my savior. Well, here's what chapter 10 really is doing. In Romans chapter 10, Paul is quoting Old Testament prophets in order to demonstrate that salvation by a system of faith was always what the word taught. It was nothing new with him. He was not introducing some new kind of doctrine. Okay. In the Old Testament, that faith was first expressed by circumcision. If you want to go back, well, what's that first expression of faith? Well, Abraham, he believed God. God said, all right, you're going to circumcise your family, your, the sons. And he did so. If you weren't circumcised, you were not part of the people of God. Good example of that, even Moses was threatened with death for not circumcising his own sons. We read about that in Exodus 5, 24, 25, and 6. In the New Testament, we are still saved by faith. It's always been by faith. But we express that faith in a different way. We, we don't, circumcision is not the expression of faith that we have. We don't build a boat like Noah did. We don't do that. What is it that we do? Well, throughout the entire New Testament, we read that when someone believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the expression of faith called upon is to repent of sin and be immersed in water, to be baptized. That's the expression of faith. How do we know that? We'll go all the way back to Acts chapter two, where Peter stands on the day of Pentecost and he preaches the very first full gospel message. And in answer to the question of the crowd, the crowd says, well, men and brethren, what are we going to do? We, we've crucified our own savior. What shall we do? And what does Peter answer? Repent every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the proper expression, the biblical expression of faith. All right, so, the, so what about chapter 10? What's this all about? Well, the point of the passage is that as it has always been, the word guarantees that all who call upon God in faith will be saved. 
And in Romans chapter six, Paul explains that the proper expression of faith, as Peter does in Acts two, is to repent and be baptized. Now in chapter 10 verses you know, 16 to 21, Paul makes the point that in the Old Testament the people heard the word first through the prophets, then they heard it through Christ, and then they heard it through the apostles. But this word always promised salvation by faith. The problem was the people didn't always respond to it by faith. So by the way, you know, just for your own edification, remember these two, you know, learn to differentiate these two. In Romans 6, it's the expression of faith. How do we express our faith in the process of salvation? In Romans chapter 10, Paul is talking about the system. What system does God use in order to save people? And the answer to that is, well, it's a system of salvation through a system of faith. He's, he's kind of comparing uh, salvation by law or salvation by faith? And in chapter 10 he's saying, no, it's always been salvation by faith. Okay? The problem as far as the Jews is concerned, they didn't respond with faith. Therefore, they didn't express that faith. Isn't that correct? Didn't they come to John the Baptist and refuse to be baptized? Refuse the expression of faith? So even this rejection was known and recorded by God in His word. In other words, His word did not cause the rejection, but it recorded it. It even predicted it. That's the amazing thing. The word of God even predicted that the Jews would ultimately reject Christ, reject the system by which God established salvation. So this prediction demonstrates in an ironic way how God's word never fails. One more example of this principle. So Paul shows how the word, the law, never fails, even in predicting the infidelity and failure of the Jews themselves. You know, we've covered a lot of things here, but remember the question, the original question, uh, Why did the Jews fail? Uh, was there something wrong with the word? And Paul says, no, nothing wrong with the word. It always succeeded. It always did what it said. It always, you know. And, and as the kind of cherry on the cake, it even predicted that the Jews would reject not only the Savior, but the system as well. All right, chapter 11. Another question arises. It's a but question. But the word says that God will preserve Israel and save his people. Has God failed in this? Has the word been incorrect? So Paul answers this in chapter 11 and his answer is, well, no. Even among the Jews, there are some who have received the promise by faith. In other words, not all Jews have been rejected. He has saved many of them. I mean, Peter and the 12, the 500 disciples mentioned in 1 Corinthians, the 3,000 who were baptized at Pentecost, the Jews who believed with Paul's missionary work, and all of those Jewish people who have believed since. So not all the Jews rejected, some, not the majority, but some have. So in Romans chapter one, Paul explained that those who reject God, God permits them to disengage from Him. Right? It's as if he says, oh, you don't want to obey me? You want to sin? Okay, go ahead, fill up your cup. That's what you want to do. Well, in the same way, the prophets spoke of those among the Jews who would, uh, who would uh, be let go. God does not keep a person or a people against their will. So let's read 11, let's skip over to 11 verse seven. He says, what then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. 
Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. So God has not failed. He has saved His people, those who have come to Him by faith in Christ. These are His saved people and they are saved. And those who have rejected Him will, as the word has promised, be rejected and lost forever. So nothing wrong with the word. It's the people that have made the mistake. In this case, he's talking about the Jewish people. Now, in verse 11 to 24, there's another question. And the other question is, does this mean that there is no hope for the Jewish people? So in verse 11, he says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So Paul responds to that question that God uses their failure not to annihilate them, but to bring others to salvation and to motivate them, the Jews, to believe. So when the Jews themselves respond, it glorifies God because the promise goes full circle. Promised to the Jews, they reject it, it goes to the Gentiles, they accept it, and because of their acceptance, whoops, some of the Jews accept it as well. Full circle. He also uses this section to warn the Gentiles who accepted the gospel not to use this as a reason to boast or to despise the Jews. So in verses uh, 20 and 21 he says, quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, meaning the Jews. But you stand by your faith, do not be conceited but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, those are the Jews, He will not spare you either, the Gentiles. They were grafted in, so to speak. Okay? So there's a warning there. In chapter 11, 25 to 32, He reveals a prophecy. Let's look at that. And the prophecy is, the Jews will remain until the end of time. So here's another promise in the word that has yet to be completed. The Jews as a nation will not all be destroyed and disappear. They will continue until the end of time. Why? They're a witness. They are a constant, they are a constant witness to God, to the history of the salvation that God brought through Jesus Christ. They are part of that. So he talks about you know, the fullness of the Gentiles. That expression refers to the end of time when the last person will be saved uh, and Jesus returns. The Jews will continue to the end, he says, unlike other nations who come and go with time. Where are the Babylonians? They're gone, right? Where are the nations of old that were formed? Many have come and gone. I mean, you, you ever take out a map of 100 years ago and, and look at that map, especially of Europe and that? I mean, half the countries have different names, different borders, nations come and go. But 2,000 years ago, Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit says concerning the Jewish nation, they stay till the end. Have they become a great nation? Have they become a powerful nation? No, just, you know, just a small group of people on that little strip of land, but they're still there. The most powerful nation in the world uh, during the 1930s, Germany, did their level best to try to wipe them out murdered at least six million and counting of them, and yet somehow, what happened? They survived. They even survived to go back and live in their you know, historical territory where they were uh, for centuries. So part of them will never believe. You know, the partial hardening is of the nation, not individual. This comes from their own disbelief from generation to generation to this very day. But in every generation, some of them will believe, thus fulfilling God's word about them 
that he would save them. So let's just read that. He says, for I do not want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, the ones who don't believe from, heart, from, from, from generation to generation until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That's the end of the world. Okay, verse 26. It says, and so all Israel will be saved just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. All Israel is not the cultural Israel, it is the spiritual Israel that receives Jesus Christ. That's the spiritual Israel. All the ones who come to Christ in the same way you came to Christ. You know, some of you have different cultural backgrounds, Irish, Scottish, English, German, Italian. You know, we all have different cultural backgrounds. And yet we've all come to Christ in exactly the same way. Paul is saying the Jews, their cultural and historical background different than ours, but in every generation, some of them come to Christ in the same way we have come to Christ. Now, many people use this particular passage to maintain a doctrine that says that all the Jews in the world will be saved eventually. This idea is contained in premillennialist theory, usually espoused by evangelicals. But this belief violates every other scripture about salvation and how it's attained. You know, it's interesting to note, or interesting note, is that this incorrect view, you know, that all the Jews will eventually be saved, helped form a lot of American foreign policy towards Israel in the 70s, because the thought was a friend of Israel is a friend of God. Because at that time, Jimmy Carter's administration, many in that administration ascribed to this premillennial idea they were Baptists, they were evangelicals, as and as politicians, a lot of their thinking creeped into, a lot of their religious thinking creeped into their formulation of policy, especially towards Israel. But Paul says that God's word has not failed even the Jews. They were chosen and they were beloved and they were blessed just like the word promised. They were the very first to receive the promise I mean, Jesus was a Jew. And those who received it by faith were saved. So not all the Jews were saved, but some were. We read about it at, uh, you know, in Acts 2, 3,000, mostly Jews or converts to Judaism became Christians. Paul also warns the Gentiles to be careful about their attitudes towards the Jews. Since it was Gentile unbelief that caused God to create a Jewish race through Abraham, it was Jewish unbelief that helped spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And it is through Gentile belief that the gospel is being spread back to the Jews. I mean, there is a church of Christ in Jerusalem. You know, I've met with that church. So Christ's word is being spread by Gentiles, not Jews. There's the irony of it. But God maintains the Jewish people as a witness throughout history. So in this way, both Jew and Gentile see their need for each other and God uses both to save the other. In chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who uh, became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. A doxology of praise, spontaneous praise, that's what a doxology is. Peter gives a doxology for the way that God has woven all of these things together to accomplish his purpose. So let's summarize what we've talked about this morning. The question originally was, 
Why did the Jews fail to obtain salvation and grace? Did the law or the, wor uh, or the word fail them? And the answer to that question is, Paul demonstrates that God's word has never failed and he gives many examples of God saying something is going to happen and it happens. Secondly, he explains that the Jews failed to receive the promise because they tried to obtain it by works and not by faith. Thirdly, Paul shows that God's word has always taught that faith is the basis by which man receives God's promises, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Number four, he also shows that the Jews never responded properly to the word and this fact was actually predicted by the word. That's how sure the word is. And number five, the Jewish nation, well he explains rather that even Though the Jews in general failed to receive the promise, God's word did not fail because it said that the Jews would continue until the end of time and they will, although they continue mostly with disbelief. And also that he will save a remnant. And the fulfillment of that is that in every generation, some Jews believe and are saved, thus fulfilling his word on this particular topic. So the refusal of grace for the Jews leads to destruction, but Paul explains in every age, those who accept his grace, God freely gives them salvation. Okay, that was a, a lot of material, three chapters, complicated chapters actually, and just one lesson, hope we're able to follow along. And I hope that I've given you some insight as to why others you know, believe what they do believe concerning salvation. And you have a, you know, an intelligent response to that strictly from the word. So when somebody gives you Romans 10 as the way to express faith, you just flip that over and, and bring them to Romans 6 and show them this is the proper expression of faith and then go back to Acts chapter two to confirm Romans six. Always answer uh, Bible questions with the Bible. That's the best way to debate, the best way to have a conversation about that. Okay, that's the end of our lesson. One more to go, one last lesson, and we're going to finish up next time. Thank you very much.